Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study and continuing studying uh, the line of Rome in Daniel chapter 11, verse 14 to 24. Uh, but before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we are so thankful that we can be here this morning at the end of a week of morning studies and um, for the light that you have shone upon us and the comfort that you have given us. In spite of ourselves, Lord, we know that you care for us and that you um, want to use us in whatever little way you can to your glory. And so we submit ourselves to you and to your leading. And um, we pray that as we open your word together, that your Holy Spirit can be here to teach us, that you can comfort each one of us, and that you can help us to be an influence for good, and that you can bless the interactions that we have with others today. Be with us now in our midst. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. and. Um, so there's lots that we have to look at today. I want to try to finish up this line. And um, so just to go back quickly through Daniel, um, when we when we start looking at Julius Caesar, um, which represents Bush II, turning his face toward the fort of his own land, right? He shall stumble and fall. And we still haven't figured out how we can take Caesar's assassination on March 15th, 44 BC, and how we can line it up with uh, the end of George Bush II, right? So George W. Bush, it, it, it's, it's kind of a weird symbol. We're going to have to try to understand that. The only thing that we can say is that there is a contrast between here, between Christ and him taking the shame upon himself, the reproach, even though he has no reproach himself. He doesn't have his own reproach, but he's going to take our reproach upon himself. And then we see this contrast with Julius Caesar, um, who's going to want to be God, but he ends up assassinated, right? So in a sense, both of them die. Um, but what that means, what these symbols mean, exactly as we, we relate to our time, we're not certain, right? So we don't fully understand that yet. But then we have, of course, uh, Obama following George Bush. And um, we looked at uh, the fact that he is a raiser of taxes and the fact that we have from, um, uh, I guess what it was, was... Uh, let me see here if I can find that again. Yeah, that was from, yeah, I'm just not bringing that up, okay. Yeah, so that was from uh, Bush's, so from, from 9-11 to Obama's inauguration is 2,688 days, that number that we have for um, the application for the additional extension of time to file your taxes. So, so that 2,688 days, if we counted from 9-11 to the other place where we count the 2,688 days, and that's Thanksgiving in 2022, we have 2,688 days between Thanksgiving in 2022 and April 5th, 2030. Or if we count like the last day, April 4th, 2030, it'd be a cardinal count. Um, the thing that's kind of interesting also is from uh, 9-11 to that Thanksgiving in November 22nd uh, or November 24th in 2022, right? So that Thanksgiving, it's uh, 7,744 days, which is 88 squared, which I, I thought was kind of interesting because of the significance of the symbol of 88. Um, but uh, anyway, the main point that that we have here with um, with Obama is this symbol of the taxation, and um, and then we're going to have, of course, after Obama, 
we're going to have uh, Tiberius Caesar, so Trump. And so Trump ends up being um, the, the midnight cry way mark in our lines, uh, the second angel empowered. And we mark that, at least I've marked it, as November 9th, 2016, when Trump uh, becomes uh, elected as the president. He's not technically the president. But the thing about that is we have a 9-11 and an 11-9. It's not the 11-9, 2019, but it is an 11-9. And then we have the two January 20th, the formalization with Obama becoming president. And then we would put Biden... And, and this is just where I place him. Um, I did this this morning here, just to put, put this in. So we have, um, so I'll just show you the chart. <clears throat> so we got Biden and I just put in his inauguration. So January 20th, 2021. So obviously that's uh, going to be after the January 6th uh, insurrection, whatever you want to call it. I call it the siege of Washington. Um, so, so we have uh, uh, the 14 days in there. Is this paper available? You mean um, which paper? The Daniel 11 study or yeah, the Daniel 11 study? I think I have it, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I keep we keep updating it. So, um, right, that's what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, these are going to end up being in, you know, these charts are going to end up being in the paper itself. Um, oh, I got you. Okay, you still yeah. still work in I, progress. Still work yeah. in progress. It's still a work in progress. I mean, I think I did share it once, not long ago, on um, WhatsApp in the Unity group. But. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, there's obviously lots of changes that, that are going to happen. And once, once we get it done, I mean, I'm going to have it a little more uh, presentable with all the charts in there and, uh, and everything. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. So, so anyway, you know, this is, this is laying out, um, these different, uh, emperors. Well, Julius isn't an emperor, but, and Titus isn't an emperor in 70 AD, right? But we ha we have them here as what's being described. Now, in Biden, if we look at the third angel arriving, and we're putting Biden there, and we're comparing it to Titus, um, um, that means that we're looking at, at Biden as the siege. So, you know, one of the things I probably should do is just say that this is January 6th. Right. If I'm going to line up the siege of Jerusalem with um, our history and the history of Biden, this would be January 6, 2021. So, so we're Obama. We're just marking his inauguration, and that's that, and that's because of the symbol of the 2,688 days. With Trump, we mark November 9th as the symbol, and then with Biden, January 6. Is the symbol where we would mark him, um, and you know, if we look at the characteristics of each of these, Augustus is uh, this taxation, which of course we're, we're just marking the you know, start of Obama's um, reign with that 2,688 days from 9/11, and then we have a Tiberius. He comes in by flatteries, so we're marking when Trump comes in, attains the kingdom by flatteries. Um, and that's going to be the November 9th date in which he's, you know, pronounced as the winner. And then with Titus, it's the siege. Now, there's also the league as well. But it goes back and it talks about the league, but the league leads to this siege. That's the whole purpose of showing that. And then, um, you know, it's going to address the diaspora and everything after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Um, any thoughts on this so far? I mean, there's a lot of logic involved in this, but it doesn't mean it's always correct just because it's logical. I think one of the <clears throat> the better anchors that we're using in this right now is going to be these 2,688 days between Bush the second and Obama. 
Yeah, well, that becomes, yeah, and it's it's 9-11, which is this important waymark, uh, obviously, where right. we're marking George Bush. And, you know, and, 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 and it's, now part of the thing here is we have Julius Caesar and this contrast with Julius Caesar and Christ. So the crucifixion of Christ, him taking the reproach upon himself, and Caesar just being murdered, right, in this sort of, in his ambition, I mean, they just become scared of his ambition, decide the only thing we can do really is kill him. Um, you know, we've, we heap all these honors upon him, but he's just going to become a despot, you know, uh, he's going to become this, this power we can't control and we'll probably all end up dead. So, so they decide to murder him with the 23 stab wounds. So, so when we look at Bush the second, what we have with Bush, is really it's just about what happens at 9-11 with the Patriot Act and those things also being put in place. 9-11 has these two different way marks. So, so when we put the Patriot Act as the empowerment of the first angel, and we all, so that's 9-11, and then we have 9-11 and it's Bush's actions. I don't know, you know, you know, I don't know why because we looked at putting November 9th, 2019 there. But this seems to be much more solid because it allows us to preserve the different presidents that we have already lined up in that way. But it means that the details that we see in the lines uh, really are going to be a zoom into the different way marks. That is, we can zoom into... Obama's history, we could zoom into Trump's history, we could zoom into Biden's history, which is zooming into Augustus. And we're going to have a zoom in uh, later in Daniel, right? So we're going to address this whole history then, you know, if we go back at, at our document here, right? So, so you have all this, it goes up to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, the crucifixion of Christ, all of those things are going to be done, right? And in, in we're going to have the Roman League. It's going to go and cover that history. It's going to deal with the Battle of Actium. But then when we deal with the rise of, um, so, so this part's going to end, deal with Rome, pagan Rome, and the rise of the papacy. And, that, and it's going to go back to cover this history of Octavian which is Augustus, right? So it, it's going to go back and cover this history. And, and we don't really have an interpretation for it. We spent time looking at the historic interpretation to some degree of some of this, um, especially in the past. Um, but, but how this applies in our history, we're not sure. But the point is it goes back and covers this. Um, and, and then that's going to lead to the rise of the papacy, right? So it's going to bring us up to uh, the end of pagan Rome and then the rise of papal Rome. So, huh, I mean, there's still lots of information that we have, that we have to look at. And so, and, and right now it's mostly Swearingen's um, interpretation in here. I did put like the Hebrew numbers in and we kind of looked at it briefly. But in order to get to the end of this line, you know, this, this line here is going to bring us to this history. And, and part of it is, well, we look at this history, verse 23 to 24, and we put Parminder in there. So this is, is, is somehow a zoom into uh, these other lines. I didn't actually share the file there. I didn't, I didn't hit share. Clicked on it, but I didn't hit it share. So, so we're going to have this this issue that we we know we have these repeat and enlarges, and we have these zooms into these way marks. So, comment. You said you had Parmander in there in this paper. Yes. Yeah. So when we go over into where was this? Yeah, right here, Pompey and Parminder, we, we had, had put in. So if we're oh, going yeah. to do that, now, so we're just saying that, that, that this is the papal interests of Rome within Adventism. 
and then we put Parminder there. Whether that's correct or not, I have no idea. But um, this had to do with the League, right? So this is the League made with Rome. So this is going to deal with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And we're going to mark the destruction of Jerusalem somewhere in, in our history. Now, when we, and in the verse 22 up above where we had the crucifixion of Christ in 31 AD, you know, we, I put there July 18, 2020. And that may change, right, on, on a, based on how we we understand this line. Yeah. Uh, hmm? I just said, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, um, and so here we have, you know, Julius Caesar, which is Bush II, um, Augustus, that's Obama, and Tiberius, that's Trump. And, and so if that's the case, then this history here, you know, would relate to our lines, right? But then we have to go back in verse 23 and 24 with this league, and we, we haven't put an interpretation exactly on how we would do this. We do know we have a parallel between the 360s um, here and uh, the 6256, that we have this, this structure. So this even for a time has an application in our history, and it's going to relate to... Uh, November 9th as a symbol, uh, 622, June 22nd. So the, the, the publication and the international uh, attention, I guess you might say, from the publication in the Tennessee. And, and then it's going to end on December 25th, 2021. And so, so that, that whole history here um, is going to relate to our history. So it's going to be from 9-11 to the end of our 777 structure is what, what I assume that it's going to be talking about. And then the dispersion of the Jewish people after the destruction of Jerusalem would have to refer to what happens within the movement itself. So that is, we have to be able to parallel what happens in this movement with the destruction of Jerusalem and the dispersion of the Jewish people. So that's why we have Parminder in here. We're saying that this Jewish league, something that infects the church, uh, also relates to this movement, what happens in this movement. So a simple way of just stating it is that when we look at this, this Jewish league and we as Seventh-day Adventists, we recognize that that was a bad thing, right? It ended up in the destruction of Jerusalem. And then we look within Adventism, Adventism has also made um, leagues with uh, the Protestants, right? And the United Nations. Correct. Yeah, but that that's not the parallel here, right? So I, I understand what you're saying. Um, but it's it's more the league with the Protestants that, that's being illustrated here. Yeah. Okay. So this is the league right. with Rome. And, and Rome here is not representing the UN. Rome is representing the papacy. Um, and when we look at somebody like Parminder, Parminder is representing this type of um, deceptive uh, infiltration that we see with the interests of papal Rome in Adventism. We see that happening within our movement. So our movement is illustrating what's happening and what's going to happen within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, what has been happening. Um, so our movement becomes a type. <coughs> and Parminder is just uh, that he's, he's embodying that type with what he's teaching and how he's teaching it, how he's going about doing things. So, um, you know, if you're going to say he shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, Right. So we're going to have ultimately, you know, we have Pompey here. That's going to be the siege in 63. But Rome itself is going to continue to take over Jerusalem. And ultimately, with Titus, we're going to have the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Right. And and we looked at that verse, he shall scatter among them 
the prey, the spoil, and the riches, we can say that among them is not in the Hebrew. Uh, it's not there. It's not represented as, as a word. It's just he shall scatter the prey, the spoil, and the riches. Nothing about among them. And that would be ultimately uh, refer to the scattering of, of the Jewish people. And, and, of course, all of the things that happened with the destruction of Jerusalem. And then, of course, we know that he forecasts his devices. Um, there's an against or from uh, the strongholds. And this is going to be for a time, 360 years, right? So we have two different periods that can be marked, 31 BC to 330 AD and 48 BC to 313 AD, right? So that's... So, so to us, in, in understanding this, there, there's something here that we, we need to recognize about these, these two verses is that it's a zoom into, right? So it's, it's, it's not, it's a repeat and enlarge of the particular history addressing, um, well, all the way from the league up to 330 AD. Right. So you've got this Jewish league in 158 and and then this league in 330. Okay. So. So I don't think we can just. You know, brush it aside. It's 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 definitely there. These two different. um, And and these two different periods of 360 years are all connected. and, And that structure has to exist in our history. So if we're going to apply these verses. It's not just like it's it's going to have to go back, right? It's going to have to go back to 9-11 and then up to December 25th, 2021. So so that would be a, a separate line just from 9-11 itself. Okay, so I said I was going to say it simply. It didn't necessarily do it simply. But does that make sense then? That when we deal with this history of the siege that, we're just marking that with Titus as the siege, that there is actually a whole line here that is going to be expressed in which line is it? Um, you know, in this line, right? So we have this one, and then we have this one. So even for a time, it's going to address our whole line. So that means verses 23 and 24 of Daniel 11 are going to represent this entire history in symbolic language so so it's it's not really on this line so when we look at this line and we we, verses 23 and 24 are here but you can see that they would be a whole line so we have to zoom in into the third angel arriving and draw out that line which we already kind of did but it's going to be a line it's not it's going to have all of the the way marks and if we look at trump this line specifically, so if we zoomed into the second angel empowered, we would also see our line, right? Because there's a whole bunch of things that happen in, in Trump's history that are in those verses that we could, we could express as a line and they exist in symbols. Now with Obama, that's going to be expanded upon dealing with, uh, you know, the history of Augustus as Octavian, right? And, so that's going to be later verses. So each of these way marks can be zoomed into to create a new line. Now we do have this, this way mark, which we had the other one, the fourth angel arriving. And whatever this is, um, it is a repeat of history. Now we could argue that what we see with Octavian, that that is going to be the repeat of history. So when these verses so we we have this it brings us up to the end of this history and then we start looking again he pagan rome the king of the north shall stir up his power and courage against the king of the south with a great army the king of the south shall be stirred up so this is going to be the battle of actium which has already been mentioned right it's even for a time so it's going to go back and repeat this history but this whole history is describing the fourth angel arriving That is, what's here in Daniel 11, verse 25, probably up to, um, I'm not sure exactly where we would would end this. 
I mean, obviously by verse 31, uh, you're going to have the papacy. Right. So here you have pagan Rome and then it's going to move to the papacy. But so probably to verse 30. I don't know if maybe maybe you could take when the papacy arises as being the Sunday law. So maybe verse 32 all the way up to verse 32. I don't know because we haven't got there yet. But you can see how this is a repeat of history and this would be the fourth angel arriving. Right. So the fourth angel arriving is a repeat of this other history. So can we see that the history of Octavian in Daniel chapter 11 with, you know, Anthony and, and Cleopatra and all that stuff, that that can be the fourth angel arriving? Does that make sense? You know, if we're looking at this as Millerite history, we're repeating Millerite history, right? So even though they have this history of Augustus, Right up here in verse 20, um, we can say that this history is going to be repeated, and it is repeated in the book of Daniel. Does that make sense? Do you understand the logic of how how Daniel 11 is working and why it relates to our lines so so easily? I believe. Which, so. Okay, so so we can see that that history, when you have uh, the Battle of Actium, that's going to be under August, Augustus. Now, we're saying, well, Augustus represents Obama, right? But in Obama, we don't see, we don't see a bunch of things just in the Obama itself, right? In Daniel chapter 11, when we're just dealing with Caesar Augustus. I mean, it's obviously preparing for the crucifixion of Christ. Because the whole purpose of this line is that it's going to address Rome, and Rome is going to come in and establish the vision and crucify Christ. And so that's going to be illustrated in our history with, you know, coming up to Biden. But then once we get to verse 25, we now repeat the history of Augustus. OK, so that's a repeat of the second angel's message, which is it formalized in this case, like the formalization of the second angel's message. And. um so it, it makes sense that we have this fourth angel arriving as a repeat. And it's a repeat of that history of Augustus that's been talked about as this prophecy, right, from the Battle of Actium to 330 AD, 360 years of time. So you can see we still have lots of work. You know, I, I would say with Daniel chapter 11, you know, we're, in, in this study, we're probably half the way through. You know, this is study 140. So I would think if we're going to finish this properly, the rest of Daniel 11, we're going to start to see that all of these things will come together, especially as we get into the later verses of chapter 11. And, and maybe we can do it, you know, more quickly as time goes on. I don't know. But we seem to just keep noticing more detail. Um. And in a sense, we've already covered Daniel chapter 12 in lots of different ways as well, because we looked at its connection with, with the book of Revelation. Um, but I think we'll see how these lines um, fill out as time goes on. So as far as this line is concerned, I think that this line is done, right? It's just that we, we would then have to do a line you know, addressing each of these histories, which which we have done in a, in a sense. We're just going to have to finish off that line here. So if we go here, for instance, this is this is addressing the Battle of Actium, right? So it's this even for a time. So this history, this 360 years uh, that we see in that line. And uh, so... So the Jewish league, so if we go back to verse 23, it says, after the league made with him, that is, it's the Jewish Roman league made with him, that's pagan Rome, he shall work deceitfully, that is, that's pagan Rome, right? And it's going to use the league for furthering Roman interest in the eastern regions. And then it says, for he, Pompey, so this is just... Uh, you know, the general, he's 
he's going to enter into, he shall come up and shall become strong with the small people. So we're saying that this is the siege in 63 BC. And then when it says he shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, well, this is the further expansion of Rome into that area of Syria, Judea, and Egypt. And then when it says he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers, he shall scatter them, shall scatter the prey, the spoil, and the riches. Yea, he shall forecast his devices against uh, against the strongholds um, or from the strongholds, depending on which way we understand that both are correct, even for a time. So it's going to lead to the destruction of Jerusalem, right? So this is obviously Titus who's going to do this. This is Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. And uh, so if we look at this line, then how would we relate this line to what we see in front of us? So we know that we have the two periods of 360 years. Here we put two periods of a time that is the Hebrew number 6256. And we notice that if we counted back from December 25th, 2021, we came to November 9th, 2004, which happens to be the center of the 30 years from November 9th, 1989 to November 9th, 2019. And it can be represented as 5,479 days. So two periods of that. And then we, we could also go back to 9-11 and count the 6,256 days. And it would bring us to Jeff's summary after the camp meeting in 2018, where he's going to go through what we had learned about the 391 at that point. We don't have the July 18, 2020 prediction at that time. That's not going to come till November. So at the end of October, we go through that. It's going to be like five days later that I, I noticed July 18, uh, 2020 on the Julian calendar. And then next week, uh, July 18, 2020 on the Gregorian calendar. Right. So. So that that summary there is 377 days before November 9th. And and Jeff is actually writing on the whiteboard at that time, the number of days, by the way, which is kind of interesting. I can't remember which is the first day that he did that, but it's probably earlier, I would think. Uh, yeah, it would have been shortly after the prediction that he starts doing that. But he's going to be writing, you know, the countdown every morning. Um but then from November 9th, 2019, we have uh, 226 days to 622. And, and it's interesting if you go back from November 9th, 1989, it's going to bring you to um, March 27th, if you count 226 days in 1989. Um, and then we have, of course, from that, we have 187 days to December 25th. 2020 and then the 365 days to December 25th, 2021. Um, any other things here? So if, if we look at this and we were going to draw this as a line, we would have a time at the end, right? That would be November 9th, 1989. But as far as all the other way marks, how would they fit into this line? Is there something that needs to be added here? Okay, so we have that word even, right? So that's going from the center of this structure um, to the June 22nd, 2020 date. You know, so how do we address these as waymarks? I mean, can we mark the center of a chiasm as a waymark, even if there's not a particular event on that day, November 9th, 2004? So could we say, for instance, the first angel arrives November 9th, 1989, this first angel is formalized in this line on September 11th, 2001, and that it's empowered at the center of this chiasm, that is the symbols are, right? So that we don't, we wouldn't really need events, we just need these symbols as an empowerment of a message that we maybe didn't understand at the time, but we understand now. So can we say that November 9th, 2004, 
is an empowerment of a message regarding this line here that we're looking at, this even for a time that parallels the line that we see in Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 24, this even for a time, that this is a message that can be empowered by just plainly a symbol, not by an event. Because what I want to do is just draw this out as a line. So when we have these lines, we always have these symbols here. I'm just going to borrow these. So if I'm going to put them in here, I'm just going to drop them down here for now. So I can say the first angel arrives here. The first angel is formalized here. And, and what we haven't done is we haven't, we're saying it's empowered here. We haven't even figured out what this message is, what the darkness is, what this, um, because because we'd have to say that there because there's something that goes back and, and I'm not saying that this is right I'm just saying that if we looked at it this way because we have this league now if we're going to put the league would that league not represent something that has happened within Adventism that would go back before 1989 and that's going to be the period of darkness right so we would put the darkness here but we need something that it is. So what is it? What is this line about when it comes to the league, the Roman league? Any any thoughts? Specifically, we, we should have a good answer to this. So what's the darkness in this line? What's not understood? And does this line give us an understanding of? The prophetic message. Okay. Now, for us specifically... We know that there is a darkness that, that we had prior to 1989. Now, not all of us personally, but I would say prior to November 9th, 1989, you know, Jeff and me and lots of other people are studying prophecy, right? I'm reading Lewis F. Weir. Um, I know uh, when the Soviet Union falls. I know it's a fulfillment of prophecy of Daniel 11, verse 40b. So I know that at the time. I don't know it's the time of the end, right? That is an insight that Jeff had. I never thought about it as the second time of the end or the repeat of Millerite history. I just saw it as a fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 40b. So Daniel 11, verse 40b was predicted by Lewis F. Weir, not on the specific date, but as an event. So when that event happened, I understood it. But I'm not a regular Seventh Day Adventist. That is, I'm not. I'm not following the church and the leadership. I'm reading, you know, reading other materials like Lewis F. Weir, somebody who had their credentials removed, right? I'm reading um, uh, M. L. Andreessen, another guy who had his credentials removed, and they gave them back to him after he died. But um, you, you understand the point here that the church itself. When November 9th, 1989 happens, do they understand it as a fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 40b? Are they looking for this prophecy to be fulfilled? They're not, right? So the darkness would have to be this darkness of prophetic understanding that the church has. And instead, we see a lot of futurism creeping into Adventism, both within a lot of conservative Adventist um, thinking and also within uh the theologians within the church, right? So not many people are taking uh, Revelation 9 and seeing that Josiah Lich was correct. It's really popular to to dismiss Uriah, or Uriah Smith, um, Josiah Lich's interpretation of Revelation 9, right? People are going to dismiss that interpretation. In, in that history, in the, in the 1980s, for people who were Adventists then, so a lot of futurist interpretations of uh, Revelation 9. Light Bears Ministries, conservative ministry. But you got um, um, Ty Gibson's and James Rafferty. And James Rafferty is doing a presentation on Daniel chapter um, 11 that's wrong. He's also doing an interpretation of, of Revelation 9 that's wrong. Right. So there's a lot of misinformation. So when that event happens, though, it should have opened the doors or the eyes, whatever, should have opened us up to understanding 
uh, the past. And Jeff is going to have that insight. Now, when 9-11 happens, how, how could we say 9-11 is a formalization of what happened in 1989? We have it as, as the arrival of the second angel. We have it as the empowerment of the first angel. Is there a way that we can look at it as, as the formalization of the first angel in just this line? Why would it be a formalization? What is it representing that represents a formalization? Because this is dealing with Rome, remember, and our understanding of Rome, Rome forecasting its devices from the fortress or against the fortresses, right? Even for a time. Are people following what I'm saying? I think that you're giving a good point about what was going on at that time. Yeah, and, and then we need to understand what this has revealed to this movement, right? So that is, even when we look at, at November 9th, 2004, as an empowerment, it's, it's an empowerment just as a symbol of this structure. That is, this movement is has come to understand something that Adventism generally does not understand, right? That is, an understanding of prophecy that had been abandoned. That is, we had taken and adopted uh, the Protestant way of looking at things. Well, here's a good example. So when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, I read um, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, right? So I didn't have my own copy. A friend had had copies of it, so I borrowed it. And I read, you know, all of the articles in there. I didn't necessarily go through the entire commentary on everything. But all of the articles and and one of the main articles had to do with how we interpret the Bible. I can't remember who wrote it because this is, you know, 40 years ago. Um, but uh, the article was talking about um, that basically we use the historicist, uh, the historical critical mes- method. Right. Whether it used those terms or not, it was describing that. So it talked about how the Jews always looked for the hidden meaning in things, you know, like gematria and um, all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, different relationships of words, uh, like hidden symbols within words. And that we as Protestants don't do that. That we just accept, uh, we accept what's in the Bible based upon uh, the context of how the people at the time would have understood it. And of course that really weakens God's work. It it's um it's basically for lack of a better word, a castration of God's word, right? It makes it impotent, correct? They don't mention anything about Miller's rules, do they, in Bible commentary? No. No, and 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 they they uh, disparage what they call the proof text method. Now, there is a misuse, in a sense, you could say, of the proof proof text method. But it's sort of a a characterization, which is more a caricature of, you know, they'll use an example where it says, uh, you know, you compare scripture with scripture in a proof text method. And, you know, um, you, you just compare things completely out of context that have no relation to each other. Um, now it is true that Paul in the book of Hebrews, takes a bunch of verses out of context to show that Jesus is God. But there's a reason why he can do that, that people have did not recognize, or, you know, Adventist scholars don't recognize. So they kind of say, well, Paul can do it because he's inspired, but we can't do it. You know, when you apply the virgin birth, for instance, you use Isaiah uh, chapter 7, verse 14, and, you know, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. I mean, it's obviously not talking about Christ in the immediate context. If we if we were to do that, if we were to seriously take that view, that we have to only take what was understood in the immediate context, then we could not use that verse to refer to Christ. Now they can say, well, in the New Testament they quote it in reference to Christ, so so that's why we believe it's in reference to Christ. But the thing is, they could do that because there is a biblical principle that they understand that the Bible is typical, that every story that happens, every king of every son of David is a type of Christ. Manasseh is a type of Christ. 
but we don't understand that. We, we, we want to just take the, the, we use the Bible more as a devotional book, just as we do with the spirit of prophecy, than as a book that's inspired, right? In Seventh-day Adventism, I would say that they look at the Bible mostly devotional. It's got lessons that we can learn, that we can apply to everyday life, correct? Is that what we get in our sermons? Yeah, it would appear that way, yes. Yeah, it's like this is just a story, you know. We we might say that it's a true story or something, but it, it's the lessons that we learn about, you know, how to love one another and, you know, and how to have good relationships and and those types of things. You rarely see the Bible being presented prophetically that you're going to take a story in, in the Old Testament and say, this is relating to what's happening right now prophetically. Right. They're just not going to do that. So so the Bible isn't a prophetic book for most Adventists. It You know, it had some prophecies in the past. Those were fulfilled, but definitely nothing talking about today. Now, of course, we have a misuse of scripture, futurism, which then is going to um, in, reinterpret prophecy. And that happens within Adventism. So you can see that the futurism type of applications with you know, are popular with, with Adventists. So the Adventists who generally are going to be talking about prophecy are going to be looking at uh, uh, events the around them and using using the prophecies of the Bible and reinterpreting them in a literal way. Yeah, Jeff, what did you say? Just they put the trumpet powers in the future. Yeah, yeah. So they put the, the trumpets in the future. Revelation 9 is all future. Um, now, when we do that, when we apply... Um, these past prophecies in the present, we have to understand how they were original, what the original application of them, that is historically, what did those prophecies represent and the history in connection with those prophecies is being repeated. So we would never just say what we're doing with Daniel 11 is interpreting Daniel 11 as specifically referring to our time. We know that it was fulfilled in the past. So its application to our time is a repeat of history, right? It's not a direct prophecy. So when we're looking at, you know, Trump and all those people, it's because we understand, you know, Xerxes in the past, what role he had, and that he does typify Trump in our history. Okay? So so that's why we can do this. And, and that's why when we're looking at what's happening in this line, this line is a revelation of an understanding that comes from November 9th, whether it's 1989 or 2019. The center of that is a date that we can mark because once we see this chiastic structure, this chiastic structure, all of this structure here, this is empowered by this symbolic date. When we found this symbolic date, it is now empowering a specific message. When we find it and we found it. So we're saying that that date now marks an empowerment of some understanding of scripture that we are using. OK, so, well, then we have to say, well, the second angel arrives. Well, it's going to arrive in this history. Now, I'm not saying it arrives exactly on this date, but in that history where we begin, we, we're addressing this time setting, November 9th, 2019, that all of that history, symbolized by Jeff's summary of that history, is the arrival of the second angel. And this is going to be formalized here on November 9th, 2019, right? It's going to be empowered in this history, so I'm just saying in this whole history of the seven, seven days and the third angel arrives on December 25th, 2021. And that third angel's message is a message that came to this movement. It's, it addresses the 777 years from 457 to 321. It's a message about the Sunday law and with the keys that were given us at that time, we now we're able to understand that where 
in the time of the Sunday law since 9-11. Okay, Jeff, you have a comment or not? Just your, your mic was on. So, okay. Now, does this make sense that we can take this even for a time and, and we can put it on a line like this and that this is a valid line? And this empowerment is that history of the seven, seven days. All those things that are going to happen between November 9th, 2019, up to December 25th, 2021. That is an empowerment of this understanding of prophecy. That is, it, this movement comes to understand prophecy in a way that had not been understood before. And it's a gradual progression. So when the third angel arrives in our history, we're still going to have another line that's going to expand that. And this movement should have come to understand how to study prophecy correctly. The vast majority of this movement does not know how to study prophecy. That's a, that's a pretty bold statement to make. But that's a pretty correct statement as well. Right. Well, it's, I wouldn't have said it if, if I didn't believe it was correct. But, but we can see that, that they're doing the same thing as the Protestants. They, they, they give it a, they whitewash it with Adventist terminology and understanding in some ways, right? But really, is there any difference? And, and I don't mean to say this in a harsh way, but from what Colin is doing, from what we see uh, the, the evangelicals doing or trying to predict events happening, in our time. Is there really any difference? Nope. No, it, 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 it's dressed up in Adventism, but it's the same type of speculative, um, futuristic applications of things. And, and we're not doing that in our studies. We're not predicting events. We're not. What we're trying to do is understand what it is we are going through and what these way marks are in a repeat of Millerite history. It gives us dates and numbers, and sometimes those dates are in the future, but we're not predicting anything about it. We don't know what's going to happen. We're watching and waiting. We're By looking at what we have passed through, the, the time that we are measuring, it allows us to understand that we are in the time, that we are correct in what we are doing. It gives us an objective measure to say this is correct. Now we can see with with Colin, he was also measuring time, but he wasn't doing it correctly. And what was the mistake he was making specifically? Because he would have structures similar to what we have here. We've actually used some of his dates and his structures because they were correct. But what was the problem with what he was doing? What was he doing specifically that was wrong? So it's pretty basic. I put Xerxes back on the throne. Okay, but is he following a, a, a line? Is he comparing his line with Millerite history? No. No, right? So it's not on a line. That is, he can see a date and a structure, but he has no way to interpret what it is. He doesn't have a period of darkness with the specific darkness. He doesn't know what that line is trying to show him. He believes that the line is trying to give him a date in the future or something where he can mark an event that he can then predict. But we know that we can't predict dates. We can't predict when events are going to occur. We, we've been clearly shown that. Just like the Millerites in 1844, you have a group, James and Alan White, who are recognizing we can't predict the second coming of Christ. And then you have other groups that are continually predicting it until finally they just give up. Some of them, the Advent church gives that up, uh, but you still have others, right? So you're going to have, you know, the um, age to come people, you're going to have Barber and then you're going to have uh, Charles Taze Russell, who's followed as Barber. You're going to end up with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, but Adventists aren't going to touch time at all, pretty much, right? Because we understand we can't predict those events. Then our movement gets stuck in this time. That is, God puts us into a time of the end. 
<coughs> that repeats Millerite history. And we start to see the dates have some, in our time, 9-11, 1989, they have symbols attached to them that can show that we're repeating history. And then we even do things like put dates in the future and predict events and are disappointed. Well, that's because we're repeating Millerite history. And then we have people who recant and say, well, we obviously were wrong in predicting those events, which is true. But we weren't wrong in measuring the time and seeing those dates. We were wrong to place those events there. But those dates are significant because they mark their, their way marks, their sacred history. And so each of these dates has to be a way mark in a line. Right. These these dates are not just dates that measure time. They're actually way marks. They're illustrating a line. They're illustrating a three step testing prophetic message. And and this movement has gone through several of these lines. We keep going through them. We keep repeating certain aspects of Millerite history because we're learning and understanding, you know, who we are and when we are. So we're understanding uh, what God is wanting to show to us. And he uses this system to show us. And either we learn it or we don't. So so this even for a time, it has all of these symbols regarding time, right? Just the symbol itself, even for a time. Now, one of the things is it shows if we say even for a time, we know there is an end of time, right? That is right now we have time that we can measure. There comes a time when we don't measure time anymore. Can we agree on that? That right now we have time? Yeah. Because we made, because we made an application for an additional extension of time to file our taxes. But for this movement, we've had time given to us. So we still have these, this objective measure. But at a certain point, we're not going to have any more time. We're not going to, I don't think that we're going to be Maybe, maybe later in, you know, in, in the great hereafter, we look back and we can see a bunch of things. Um, but we're given this time right now to sort through the problem that, that we have faced because we're in a movement that used time. And now we have to be corrected by time, you know, corrected in time. So God is correcting us. He's, he's having us see things much more clearly than we would have seen them in the past. And and so, you know, this this is about this movement This even for a time. And and we can see, though, that this is also about the message of Rome, because the message of Rome has infected this movement. But we're going to have, um, you know, the Edict of Milan and we're going to have the capital of Rome move from Rome to Constantinople. And that marks an end of something. So, you know, we have December 25th, 2021. And that is the last date that we have predicted. Right. Do have we do we have any dates after December 25th, 2021 that we have predicted? Not talking about Colin or other people, but us. Have we predicted any any events on any dates? No. OK. Now, we have put symbolic dates in the future, and we've looked at them to see what they would mean, but we never had any events attached to them. And and we, and we even with December 25th, 2021, we had made this prediction. It symbolized the Sunday law. But when we got to December 25th, 2021, we weren't expecting the Sunday law, right? You know, it's just, we had already understood that we couldn't predict that that type of an event. Okay, so so anyway, I think that this this illustrates that line. Now, um, so when we look at this here, so that's going to bring us to the end of um, of verses twenty-two, but. You know, and when we have here, so we're going to have Trump. Uh, we're going to have this crucifixion of Christ in 31 AD as July 18, 2020, because that occurs in the history of Trump. 
Obviously, Trump isn't the president uh, December 25th, 2021. So if we look at this, if we're going to try to fill this in, so we've got Tiberius Caesar, who symbolizes Trump. Um, they shall not give him the honor of the kingdom. So we can see how that relates to Trump. Um, but he shall come in peaceably. So Trump comes in. There's a peaceful, peaceful transference of power after Augustus's death. Um, so we can obviously relate that. Um, now we know that obviously Hillary Clinton wasn't too happy about losing to Trump. Uh, whether, you know, her temper tantrum is, is true or not that she had, uh, when she lost, I would think it's true, uh, the story of her temper tantrum. Um, but, uh, you know, so there, there is a peaceful transference of power from, uh, Obama to Trump. Now we don't see that, of course, from Trump to, uh, to Biden, right? So, so we could just say that this is part, in part, a contrast when it, when it applies to our history. So I'm just going to say that that is going to be uh, there. Now, one of the problems we have, though, is now Obama doesn't die. So, I mean, I don't know if that's an important point, but um, I would say that the idea that Obama is going to become president again is... I mean, it's not an impossibility. It, it is with the Constitution the way it is now. Obviously, in a civil war, uh, you could end up with um, the United States divided in some way, and you could have Bom Obama as a leader of some group within the United States or the disunited states as they would be then. But anyway, we have uh, th at this time, we have a peaceful transference of power. Now, a Trump, Trump obtains the kingdom by flatteries, right? So we would just say that this uh, is being marked. Oops, what am I going to do there? That didn't work. Computer's not responding very well. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to put here November. So we've got a nice, uh, peaceful uh, transition of power. And then you're going to have this uh well i don't know if we have to put that there i'm kind of adding the peaceful transition there with so he obtains the kingdom by flatteries in november 6th november 9th 2016 and then yeah this is not working too well okay and, and with the arms of a flood shall they now here they have alleged seditionists so what what is this referring to um historically what is Swearingen uh, doing? Why this alleged seditionist? Who, who are the alleged seditionists in this history? What history is this describing? So we haven't really addressed this too much. Anybody know what, what Swearingen is talking about here? Which these alleged seditionists, who, who are they? I haven't followed much with Swearingen, so. Okay, well, we're having his notes here. So, so obviously... He's got, what would he possibly be thinking about? Are these Christians? Is that what he's referring to? Let me see if I can find this. Because uh, I removed some of his stuff, which, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, so. So he has this alleged seditionist here. He's going to have executed. Yeah. So, increased. in other words, an alleged seditionist or those that engage in a seditious conspiracy is yeah. conspiring against authority. Yeah. So, so would this be Christians that I, I think that's what he's referring to? Um, it could be. Yeah. I'm just trying to find this in his book. Um, but I mean, the, the situation is would would this be in line with the zealots that were against Rome? Yeah, well, and that's what he's trying to say. So right. the question is, is this correct, his interpretation of 
of this. Now we're going to have the Prince of the Covenant, the crucifixion of Christ in 31 AD, right? So, um, so after Augustus, um, Augustus is death, we have Tiberius, but it says with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him. Now we haven't really understood that verse yet. Okay. So, Okay, so he's going to talk about Tiberius here. I'll show you what I'm looking at. Um, so he's talking here. I'm probably going to go back a little bit. Um, okay, Tiberius would eventually ascend to the emperorship peaceably or peacefully in a natural succession after the death of Augustus in 1480 and obtain the kingdom by flatteries, receiving a fabricated and albeit artificial flattery from the Roman Senate. Um, so they're saying that he's being flattered. Okay. Yet because he was a soldier at heart and preferred the army camp over the palace, Tiberius detested dealing with the senatorial hierarchy and never could fully adjust to political life. He did possess exceptional, exceptional administrative skills that were developed through his experience as a military commander, but he didn't have the proper temperament needed to command the respect of the Senate or his subordinates in government. Thus, he would have a reputation of a vile person who would not receive the respect and honor of the kingdom, as did his predecessor, Augustus. The two quotations below will confirm this observation. Tiberius was a proud member of uh, the ancient Claudian clan who had a splendid record of military and administrative achievement, but he was also grim, caustic, and suspicious, and lacked Augustus's talent for public relations. He found it difficult to get on with senators, both individually and in mass. Domestically, the reign of Tiberius was at first beneficent. Gradually, however, a change took place, and the latter part of his reign was marked by a series of conspiracies and consequent executions. Tiberius' coldness and reserve and his desire for economy and government rendered him unpopular with the people and together with his supposed depravity gave him a bad name in legend and history. To further develop an accurate character sketch of the vile attributes of Tiberius, we should understand that history portrays him as greatly deficient in self-confidence and slow to make decisions. He was not naturally amiable towards people or amiable towards people and had trouble communicating effectively. His self-esteem, would suffer further damage after he contracted a debilitating, disfiguring skin disease. And because Tiberius was also naturally sensitive to criticism, the constant worry of a conspiracy coupled with his low self-esteem eventually drove him into a state of paranoia. And this would lead him to commit unspeakable acts of cruelty towards alleged seditionists. He would eventually grow weary of Roman politics and decide to leave Rome permanently, retiring to the island of Capria in AD 26, where he would finish out his remaining years and die of natural causes. Okay. So he's going to deal with this arm of the, the, the arms of the flood as dealing with, you know, all of Tiberius reacting against uh, those who uh, are opposing him. So executing all these different people. Um. But, you know, one of the questions is, why does it lead then to the crucifixion of Christ in in his understanding? Um, so this guy's going to go through that about 70 weeks. But it just happens under. Um, yeah, so this kind of sums up some of what we've been looking at. How we understand this. Uh, Stumble in the fall, razor of taxes, vile person, prince of the covenant. Okay. So the question is, is this talking about Trump's, um, so when you go back to our document, is this talking about this, uh, this arms of a flood have to do with alleged seditionists? I mean, it does in that history, let's say shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken, executed, he has here. Um, but isn't there really something else? Because what does a flood refer to generally, just in a general sense? You mean a deluge? No, as a symbol. 
a flood. What does it refer to in a general sense? Think think Revelation chapter 12. You mean like a mass of people? Okay, well, it, it usually refers to persecution, right? Remember when the, when the water goes, you know? Right. It, it, you know, it's it's a, ty- a symbol of persecution. Okay. So now we have the arms of the flood, and, and we, it's going to be um, with the arms of the flood, they shall be overflow, right? So you're going to have flood and overflow. Uh, one is the noun, the other is the verb, right? Right. Flood is a noun. To be overflown, that's an action. <clears throat> so flood's a thing. Being overflown, that's that's an action. But they're the same word, right? They, they have different Hebrew numbers just because one's a noun, one's a verb. Okay. Now we have the arms of a flood, and that's the Hebrew number 2222. So, you know, I've tried looking at this and figuring this out. 2220. And you know, when I look at it as time, I could say, well, that's going to be six years. And how many days? I can't remember. It's not very many. Yeah, six years and 28 and a half days. You know, and so I thought, well, could we put that there? The arms, could we place it someplace in these lines? Now, we did have um, a six-year period. Um, so that was, let me see here. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. Okay, um, now if we take uh, 2,220 days, uh, that's going to be from March 7th, 2024. Three weeks from now. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what. Yeah, three weeks from now, right? March 7th is three weeks from now. Today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, And that's 2,220 days to April 5th, 2030. Now, March 7th symbolizes what? Symbolizes the Sunday law. So, so can we, um, can we take that symbol? But the arms of a flood, but the arm is something that, that, why does it talk about the arms of a flood anyway, for instance? Why the arms? I mean, it, it's, it's a refer, refer, referring to an arm, right? Now it can symbolize different things. It can symbolize strength. Um, it can symbolize like military or political strength. It can also be, uh, the shoulder of an animal that's sacrificed. It's zero ah. Zero is the word. Uh, sorry, uh, rosh ein. So be zora. Couldn't it also in, in, um, symbolize embracing something? No. No. Okay. No, it doesn't. It, it's, I mean, it, it is uh, referred to help in Psalm 83, verse 8. Uh, Asher also is joined with them. They have hope in them, hope in the children of Lot. Um, and that word hope in is, uh, uh, you know, the word arm. So that's, that's sort of like lifted them up. So in that sense, but not not ever in the sense of embracing. I mean, the, the word first shows up as uh, as arms in Genesis forty nine twenty four, and his bow abode in strength, and his arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, uh, referring to uh, that's going to be the blessing of Joseph. So. So Joseph has that symbol attached to him, the arms. But when we talk about the arms of a flood, why the arms of a flood? So it's just kind of a, so what would that refer to? Why would we have this addressed to arms? Would that be to recognize its grasp, taking control? Okay. Well, 
see, I think of it as a sense of reaching out, right? I mean, that it's it's reaching out its power, its persecution. So so maybe taking control. But the the idea is it's you know you are you're using the sense of lengthening its grasp, right? I don't know so much about lengthening, but reaching out, retaining so, grasp. So so now so at this time, of course, we don't have Christians being persecuted yet because there isn't Christians yet, right? I mean, they'll be later, I guess, but in his reign. But um, so these arms of a flood shall they be overflown? And and so the question of the they. Like it introduces a, a they, but um, but who's the they, right? So it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't apply this pronoun to any particular thing that's been mentioned before, or or has it? I mean, we could say, well, um, where it talks about uh, uh, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, and we could say, well, the they then is to those that do not give Tiberius the, the honor of the kingdom, that he's going to persecute them. So what we really need to know is who he's persecuted, because the arms of a flood symbolize to some degree the Sunday law, right? And it, it, it's doubled. With the arms of the flood, they shall be overflown. So I think we have to be able to to establish this a little bit better than what uh, the commentators do. And then when it says, uh, uh, shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. So the fact that Christ is placed right here doesn't seem disconnected from the previous uh, passage. I mean, I would think that this has to be a persecution upon Jews, not just seditionists, but we're going to have to look at that on Sunday. Okay. So any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. I pray that you can bless each person who has participated or watched in these studies and that you can speak to their hearts and that they can be encouraged by these things. Be with us um, throughout this weekend coming up with various studies and be with us in our personal lives, in our personal study. And we thank you for all things, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.